Welcome to the Foundations of Learning podcast. I hope to inspire you to actively participate in your child's learning journey, fostering a love for knowledge and nurturing the skills necessary for success in a rapidly changing world. Welcome back to the Foundations of Learning podcast. I'm your host, Shaylee Flint. Today, I am going to be talking about school vouchers, and I'm going to be asking the question, will school choice vouchers drain the public school funds? Maybe you agree with that. Maybe you don't. I am going to be going through an entire article written by the NEA. If you don't know who the NEA is, it's the National Education Association, and they are actually the number one lobbyists for education. They, I would say, are very influential in what's going on in public schools. It's not just uh, like a union for the teachers or something like that. It is far more outreaching than that, but I'm not going to get in that into that today. However, they did write an article about this topic and I am going to give my thoughts on it. Now, these are just my own thoughts and opinions on it. I did do research on some of the topics as well so that I could understand exactly what vouchers were, where the funds were coming from and all of that so that I could get the most understanding that I could about this and whether or not this is going to be beneficial for the kids or not, because that is really what this is about, right? Is we want our kids, all of the kids in our nation to have a good education because we know that a good education is going to help them down the road. And it just makes our country, our society, our world a better place if we can all be properly educated, right? So that really should be the main concern for everyone, no matter whether you are a Democrat, Republican, or whatever, because within this, they do get kind of political. And I think that with this realm of education, it shouldn't be something that is political. Anywho, I do want to premise this by saying that I was an educator in the public school system. I taught first grade for four years. And so I, I am aware of the downsides of public education. I am aware of the upsides of public education. However, I want to start this off by kind of telling you about by my own biases, I guess you could say. Um, and I do believe that every education or every school within our education system is is set up the exact same. Now, what I mean by that is that the structure of the system itself is going to be the same. I've worked in two different districts and I have seen the way that both of these districts work and one is in a more rural area, one is in more of a big city, right? So I've kind of seen those two differences, but the skeleton of a school is set up the exact same. So I believe that we should allow for school choice. And if We are all collectively paying taxes for school, which obviously like property tax, um, sales tax, and all of these other types of taxes that happen within your state are helping to fund the schools as well as some federal funding that you get from the top as well. However, I think that school choice is very important because some kids do not do well in that model or structure that we have set up for the school system, right? There are so many different avenues of how you can learn. And learning is not something that's like this linear, like skeleton. This is how everyone should learn. That is how the school system is set up. Whether we have nature schools or Montessori schools or whatever that may look like um, for the learning style that meets the needs of those children, you should have as the parent the choice to choose those schools. So I just want you to know that those are kind of my own beliefs already without even talking about what school choice is. That's just my thoughts as a former educator, being in the public education system and seeing how it works. Let's get started on the article. This is the title of the article. It says, lose your school, you lose your town. Educators in rural states mobilize against school vouchers. Okay, so the big premise in this article is really about how the rural communities are going to be impacted, not so much the city folks. So the very beginning, it says public schools everywhere have an important and unique place in their communities, but for rural areas, the role is even more consequential. Schools are more than academic institutions. They provide critical services to students who need them to need them the most. Rural schools are also hubs for community engagement through concerts, theatrical productions, and sports. Often they are a town's largest employer. At our school, we offer a lot because our community expects a lot. So as they're going through here, they're talking about how the schools or how these communities are going to be hurt because jobs are going to be lost 
via vouchers um, and that they are not going to be getting as much money um, as they would have gotten in the past because of these vouchers and that the money is going to be going to funding religious or private schools instead of the public schools. Now, it's very interesting that people are very upset about this. Like I had said before, you are paying, everyone's paying taxes. Even if you are poor, maybe you don't pay property taxes, right? You pay sales tax um, and all of these other taxes that you have to pay and that go towards education. So yes, you might not be paying as much, but that landlord that you're renting from, they are still paying property tax. So they are still paying that money, right? I don't understand why we are so upset about where it is going. Who cares if it goes to a private school? Who cares if it goes to homeschooling? Who cares if it goes to a religious school? Parents have the right to raise their child in the way that they see fit. Because let's be honest, the public school you are sending your kid away to be essentially raised by someone else for seven hours a day, five days a week, maybe more if your child's in an after school program or whatever, daycare or whatever, right? They are away from you for a very long period of time. So if that is the case and you have to send your children off, you should be able to choose how your child is educated. I don't understand why people care, whether it's private, religious, homeschool, who cares and people might say i actually did do a reel on instagram and they lost it (laughs) and people were so upset and they were like i i don't want you know uh people to or i don't want my money going to a religious cause and i don't want my money going to this cause and i don't want my money going to blah 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 blah, whatever it is not your child who cares if it is a religious thing like is it so bad that somebody is learning about god I don't think that that's like a terrible thing, okay, if they incorporate that into their lessons. Who cares, right? I don't care. So anyways, I think that that's kind of a mute point, to be honest with you. It says that the voucher legislation um, had been passed or is being considered in more than a dozen states this year. The strength and standing of rural schools will be tested. How will they prevent a drop in enrollments? How can they continue to provide the breadth of services to every student? How will an exodus of educators be stemmed? The impact is not clear yet, but I fear the short answer is you don't. So here is my question, okay? You are a public school. It doesn't sound like the voucher is going to take money from you because they're just like, I'm going to take all the money from you and I'm going to give it to all these people that want a different choice for their child. What it sounds like to me is that the enrollments are dropping because of vouchers, because there is this choice now where parents can say, hmm, I have a different choice and I can use this money toward an education that I want my child to have. Well, I'm going to unenroll my child from this school because I don't like it and I'm going to send them somewhere else. So schools, if that is the case and you are having a large number of unenrollments, you should be doing surveys. You should be asking the parents, Why is it that you don't want your child to come to this school? And then you need to adapt, right? You need to change. Whether that be, you know what? You're not scoring high on academics. Okay, well, that's a problem, first of all. Um, And second of all, I wouldn't want my kid there either if it wasn't scoring high in academics. Maybe they don't like the school environment. Think about what is it that they don't like about the school environment. Try to fix that, right? Like you should be asking parents why they don't want to go to your school because it doesn't sound like we're taking money from you. It sounds more like the enrollments are down. Therefore, you're getting less money because we do with schools, you get money per pupil. Schools, look in the mirror. Why are parents leaving? Why are your enrollments going down now that this voucher is an option. So then it goes on to say that in previous years, educators and their unions in Iowa helped defeat voucher proposals, thanks in part to steadfast opposition from enough rural lawmakers who understood the devastating impact these schemes would have on area public schools. The political terrain has since shifted quite dramatically, says Samuel E. Abrams, director of the National Center for the Study of Privatization and Education at Teachers College Columbia University. Vouchers so far have had little impact in rural areas of the country, he explains, but there's no question about their new momentum and the impact on rural schools and their communities could be grim. As the mayor of Woodbine, Iowa, told me several years ago, if you lose your school, you lose your town. So again, I am just really trying to understand because later on in this article, they do talk about how like rural, rural kids actually are like 
at a disadvantage because in the rural areas, there's usually not as many options for private schools. So that means that if parents of these rural areas are taking their kids out of schools, then, and, and they're not going to private schools because there is none available to them, that tells me that they're homeschooling. So again, <laughs> schools. You have to look in the mirror. Why are the parents unenrolling from these schools? And you're like, it's going to take jobs away and blah, 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 and whatever. And I understand that. However, if you are not providing a service that is good, then people are not going to opt into that service, right? That would be like Windows being like, me. nobody's buying my computer because they just hate me and I should have all these other people come to my company and why aren't they buying my computer? Are more people buying Apple because, I don't know, maybe they're better at marketing. Maybe their product is just better. Um, maybe they have more features that are better, whatever it is, right? So does Windows just sit there and be like, mm, people aren't liking my product, so therefore they must hate me? No, they say, okay, why do people like Apple? Why do they like it? What are they doing for marketing? And then Windows says, let's be adaptive. Let's invent something else. Let's try to change how our stuff is, you know, what our product is. Can we make it so that this phone can do something that the Apple phone can't do, right? They adapt. That is, that's why they're still alive. If they were just like me, then they're not going to be alive, right? And people are going to get mad at me for making that connection with, um, like corporations and companies because people are like, education is not a business. Listen, just because it's a business does not mean it's evil. Okay. Just because it's a corporation does not mean it's evil. Yes. Are there big corporations and companies that don't have <laughs> the best interest of the, the consumer essentially in mind? Yes but also no, because they obviously want to make money. So do you think it is kind of important in this realm of things? Because really quick, I'm going to take a quick side note. If you do not know what happens when a school fails to meet their adequate yearly progress goals, I'm going to tell you really fast. This is what happens. So basically the first year, the government's like, hey guys, not meeting your goals. You need to fix it. Let's give you some assistance here. Let's see if we can fix that. Second year, they're like, come on, guys. You really need to do better, okay? Here is some more money. Here is some more assistance. Let's try to get your teachers maybe a little bit more professional development or whatever, whatever, right? Three years, they have to offer transfers. So they have to tell parents, we're not doing very well, guys. Hey, you can transfer. Here are some schools you can transfer to. So in that, in that sense, we do have that choice where they have to tell the parents, hey, we suck. <laughs> Here's some schools that you could transfer to that are better than us, right? So in that, they do have to provide you with that. Now, by the fifth year, if they do not meet the adequate scores that they're supposed to get, they can reopen as a charter school. <laughs> We're just going to change our name, guys. We are going to no longer just be a public school. We are going to be a public charter school. It's different. <laughs> it's not you get shut down, okay? If a private school is not performing well, parents are paying out of pocket to go to this school. If their kids are not performing in a way that they think they should or they don't like the school environment or whatever it is, they're going to pull their kid out. And if enough people pull their kid out, the school just immediately gets shut down because they can't they can't move on, right? It's a business. They can't keep educating kids if they suck. Just send your kid to a school that sucks and you're like, well, but I mean, at least they're going to school. It must, it sucks, but if, at least they're going to school. What is the point? Okay, back to our article. Then they go on to talk about the high cost of vouchers. First of all, we're going to talk about vouchers and what the heck they are. Okay, so there are different types of vouchers. You have um, traditional vouchers, which is the government writes a check to subsidize tuition at private schools using funding collected through taxes. Um, there's an education savings account voucher. Instead of paying private schools directly, public funds are deposited into savings accounts that families can use to pay for private schools. Um, tax credit vouchers, individuals or businesses receive a tax credit in exchange for donations to organizations that provide vouchers to private school tuition. As a result, government tax revenue is rerouted to private organizations. Now, they keep saying private school, private school, private school. That is not the only thing you can use a voucher for. You can also use it for homeschooling. You can use it for tutoring. You can use it for all those things if you are not enrolled in a public school. Okay, so you can use it for curriculums, whatever. 
It's not just for private schools. They keep saying private schools because they like to villainize private schools, which I think is kind of funny. But anywho, so I kind of want to talk about a little bit more about Utah and Idaho, just because in particular I am in Utah. And so I do know a little bit more about that. And we have passed a voucher bill and everything like that. So I kind of know more about that just because I am in Utah and then close to Idaho. So I'm going to talk about it a little bit. So just so you can kind of see with a state that's actually doing a voucher program, what that looks like. In Utah and Idaho in particular, they do use per pupil for funding the schools. Okay, so in Utah, it's actually a scholarship. So this one is basically like the the traditional voucher, right? It's the government writes a check to subsidize tuition at a private school using funded or funding collected through taxes. And so basically what they do is they have like this lump sum of money that um, they take from the education budget. This is how I understand it, at least. And if I am wrong, please tell me. Um, But they take it from that Um, portion of the budget. They only take a portion. They don't take all of it, obviously. Um, I think it said for Utah, it's like only for like only around like 15,000 kids can get it or something like that with the amount of money that they are providing. Um, And so they take that, they put it in this like little pool. Okay. And then they have people that essentially will approve you for this scholarship or voucher. Um, And the way that Utah does it in particular is that they incentivize the people that are like choosing who's getting these scholarships, they incentivize them to choose people below the poverty line first. Okay, so first, whoever is below the poverty line, you get first dibs. Then they go to like middle class and then they go to upper class. Okay, so in this sense, they are not because this is another thing that the article talks about is like we're just this is just providing more money to the rich and the poor are getting um, screwed basically, right? Right. In this case, that's not the case. Like they are trying to get it so that the people that may not be able to afford another choice can afford another choice. And let me tell you this, they're only getting $8,000, okay? Utah spends about $10,000 per pupil, first of all, okay, in a public school. Um, Second of all, tuition in private schools, that $8,000 is not even going to cover that tuition. Now, if you decided to homeschool your child, most of the time, homeschoolers spend way less money on average per pupil than private or public schools. Um, That's merely because, right, they're doing it in their home. They just have to buy curriculums, um, things like that. So there's not as much like overhead that they have to spend, right? So when we're looking at these vouchers, I don't really understand when they're like, well, the money won't go to public schools. You get paid per pupil. And I have seen the way that districts spend money. The top heavy spending is honestly freaking ridiculous. I was in a school with a leaky roof. No joke. When it would rain, they decided to put, we had like legit, like such bad leaks that it would like drip water like really bad and out of the ceiling. And they decided to put a tarp with a like garden hose through the tarp with a garbage can to catch the rain because they were they were building a new school um and so we were going to be transferring to that new school in a couple of years and so they were just kind of like "Mm, doesn't really need to be fixed like not high on our priority list because (laughs) you guys are moving anyway so we don't get this fixed i'm pretty sure there was mold all over in that school it was so old there's so much water damage everywhere we moved to this new school and the district says we need to remodel our district office when i tell you the district office was super nice i it was okay it was super nice anywho so they decide they're going to remodel and they're like, well, we'll just move into this other school because they, you know, we've moved out now. We're now in the new school, right? So they're like, we're just going to move into that other school that they were at and we'll just be there for, you know, a year while we remodel the district office. Well, when they got there, the school was in unacceptable condition and the ceiling got fixed. All of the problems like my room flooded so it ruined a lot of my stuff. Um, so it stunk really bad. And I basically had to deal with it. We tried to get the stink out. But there was really no other option. So we had to deal with it. Pretty sure there was a lot of mold in there too. Anywho, the person that was going to be in my room for their office, it was unacceptable. And so they like ripped out the carpet. Like I'm not even kidding when I say like it's just ridiculous. I'm just telling you to look at the actions of the NEA. Look at the actions of the school districts like the superintendents and these other people, the boards. um, So like your school board, even the board of education up at the top, like look at their actions, not their words. Moving on. I found something that was honestly just a little nugget that was like, (laughs) this is honestly kind of funny. So it says, 
Voucher programs and the broader education privatization movement of which they are a part of are also deeply unpopular. Instead, education privatization is a project by deep-pocketed right-wing funders and think tanks committed to dismantling our public institutions and collective power and implementing a policy regime of social control and service of the wealthy and corporations. Now, you're probably wondering, why do I think that is so funny? And if you think that it's funny, we can be friends because you also understand the education system and what it was built upon. So... Do you know who the Rockefellers are? The American education model, as well as the system practiced there in, here in India and around the world, was actually copied from the 18th century Prussian model designed to create docile subjects and factory workers. Note, Prussia was historically a prominent German state. Mass education was the ingenious machine constructed by industrialism to produce the kind of adults it needed. How to pre-adapt children for a new world, a world of repetitive indoor toil, smoke noise, machines, crowded living conditions, collective discipline, a world in which time was to be regulated not by the cycle of sun and moon, but by the factory whistle and the clock. The solution was an education system that in its very structure simulated this new world. The system did not emerge instantly. Even today, it retains throwback elements from pre-industrial society, yet the whole idea of assembling masses of students, raw material, to be processed by teachers, workers, in centrally located school, factory, was a stroke of industrial genius. The whole administrative hierarchy of education as it grew up followed the model of industrial bureaucracy. The very organization of knowledge into permanent disciplines was grounded on industrial assumptions. Children marched from place to place and sat in assigned stations. Bells rang to announce changes of time. The inner life of the school thus became an anticipatory mirror, a perfect introduction to industrial society. The most criticized features of education today the regimentation, lack of individualization, the rigid systems of seating, grouping, grading, and marking, the authoritarian role of the teacher are precisely those that made mass public education so effective an instrument of adaptation for its place and time. Built on the factory model, mass education taught basic reading, writing, and arithmetic, a bit of history and other subjects, the overt curriculum. Beneath it was the covert curriculum that was far more basic. It consisted of three courses, punctuality, obedience, and repetitive work. The basic training requirements to produce reliable, productive factory workers, factory labor demanded workers who would take orders from a management hierarchy without questioning. And it demanded men and women prepared to slave away at machines or in offices performing brutally repetitive tasks or jobs. So when they are saying that this voucher program is a privatization movement of which they are part of like, it's these deep pocketed right wing funders and think tanks committed to dismantling our public institutions and collective power and implementing a policy regime of social control and service of the wealthy and the corporations. Dude. That's literally what the public school system was created for. Backwards speak, anyone? And if you're like, you're a conspiracy theorist, this is not a conspiracy theory. You can literally go through different quotes from Rockefeller himself and look at this. So another thing, Rockefeller gave over $180 million, which is equivalent to over $6 trillion today, Thank you, inflation. Thank you, government, for printing more money. Fantastic. Anyways, to the General Education Board. So, yes, the General Education Board, they did do some good things, okay? They funded education for those in low socioeconomic status and so on. However, let me tell you some quotes from the people that were a part of the General Education Board from Rockefeller himself. And let me know if you think he was doing this for the betterment of society. He said, I don't want a nation of thinkers. I want a nation of workers. Here's a quote by John T. Gates, which was the advisor to the John Rockefeller and founder of Rockefeller Foundation, Rockefeller University, and General Education Board. We shall not try to make these people or any of their children into philosophers or men of learning or of science. We are not to raise up among them authors, orators, poets, or men of letters. We shall not search for embryo, great artists, painters, musicians, nor will we cherish even the humbler ambition to raise up from among them lawyers, doctors, preachers, statesmen, of whom we now have ample supply. The structure of how the school system is set up is still for industrialization, okay? 
That is what the education system is for. We are not really in the industrial age anymore. Those are not skills that children need to know any longer, right? They need to know how to think, how to problem solve, how to have a discussion. They need to have emotional or social emotional regulation. They need to know how to actually socialize. And if you're like, I send my kid to school for socialization, I really ask you to just just go in for like two weeks to your child's school if you can, every day, all day. Let me know if that looks like socialization to you. The way that our school is structured is not for the betterment of society today. And 60 some percent of fourth graders cannot read on grade level. Same with eighth graders. That is ridiculous. As a nation, 50% of people can't read above like a sixth grade level Again, look at a sixth grade reading passage. It's not like the public schools are doing anything freaking fantastical, okay? And if you're like, oh, it was COVID, no, it wasn't. Go all the way back. We have sucked at teaching kids to read for a very long time. And to be honest, I think it was because it was not a priority. And the way that the system is set up, it just wasn't a priority. Back to the NEA, back to their nice little article. So even before the recent surge of voucher legislation, the amount of public taxpayer dollars being re redirected to private school tuition has been running at has been running at alarming levels. A classroom teacher and education policy researcher analyzed the voucher program's physical impact in a 2023 report released by the Southern Poverty Law Center and the Education Law Center. In each of the seven states highlighted in this report, Arizona, Florida, Georgia, Indiana, Louisiana, Ohio, and Wisconsin, expenditures of public funds on voucher programs increased dramatically from 08 to 19. That sounds like a problem at the top. I don't feel like that's a voucher problem. I feel like that's the government just... Uh, not spending their money in a way for the betterment of society. Siphoning off valuable funds from public schools is far from the only cost school vouchers inflict. Most private schools that participate in these programs have minimum, if any, standards of accountability and do not open their doors to all students. Again, they're going to say that with homeschool, right? There's no standards of accountability. Now, some states there is, like some states you actually do have to like take your kid, they have to take the state tests that every other, other state does. Sometimes some of the states are more strict on the type of curriculums that you can use and so on like it really does depend on the state you're in um, as far as like homeschooling goes however NEA I have a stat for you the NEAP data shows that there has been other research that has been found are you ready private school students score better in almost all subjects they are accountable because here it's saying that they are actually scoring better than their public school peers so they're accountable and here's why <laughs> parents pay tuition if they suck parents say you suck give me my money well not give me my money back but I'm taking my kid out of that school and then private schools wouldn't exist anymore because the parents aren't paying for it and therefore doesn't exist right so that is the accountability the free market chooses right now let's talk about homeschoolers According to the National Home Education Research Institute, home learners typically achieve test scores 15 to 25 percentile points higher than public school students on standardized academic achievement tests. They also score higher on the SAT and ACT exams and are increasingly recruited by colleges and universities. Even the home learners are outperforming the public school students. Now, with the homeschool stat, I really do think that a lot of that has to do with, one, parents care a lot about especially if they are the ones in charge of their child's education they don't want to mess it up they're going to do their very best to do what they can to make sure their children succeed obviously right because now that failure is in their hands if the public school fails they're like you know parents can like point their finger and be like well you weren't doing your job why weren't you doing your job and i'm not saying that kids that are uh, or parents that have kids in private school or public school don't care as much as homeschooled students about their academics no, if you are involved in your child's academics, it actually has been shown your child has a higher chance of achievement if you are super involved and you care about your child's education and discuss it with them, right? So that is another factor as well. However, people say, well, homeschoolers don't have that accountability. I think just the parents wanting what's best for their child is going to be accountability. Now, there are outliers. There can be parents that are not doing what they should for homeschool. I've seen it before. But for the most part, homeschoolers are doing the job that they are supposed to do. And I'm also not saying that educators do not care 
and that the districts don't care whether their their students perform well because they do. However, the way that the system is set up, it is really hard to ensure success for every single child. When you are homeschooling, you can do one-on-one with your child and that one-on-one instruction is going to be the very best instruction you can give a child. If you are working on the exact skill they need, you're working on it with them one-on-one, they are working at the pace that they need, that's always going to be better than me standing up in front of a group of 25 students and teaching them the same topic even though or concept or skill even though they are all on different levels and then going into like a small group right and kind of grouping them in the groups that kind of like for the most part this is what they need right but it's still like I'm going to be moving at a pace that might be too fast or too slow for them like one-on-one instruction is always going to be the best and unfortunately in public schools and even private schools, for the most part, I don't, not, I'm not saying all private schools because they're all pretty different, but at least in public schools, getting that one-on-one instruction or one-on-one instruction is not happening, okay? Your child more than likely is not getting one-on-one instruction. They're getting whole group instruction and they are getting small group instruction. And that small group instruction is only probably going to accumulate to maybe 30 minutes to an hour of their entire seven hours of the day. So they are being taught skills that are based on that grade level. And if they are behind or ahead, if they're behind, they're probably um, gonna stay behind unless that teacher is really good at utilizing small group. And that high kid is probably going to be bored for most of the day. So there's really like it's really hard in that system in the way that we've got it set up. And that's why I'm saying there needs to be a change at least in the way that the school systems are set up. Every school should be different, right? Depending upon different philosophies. And we should be looking at these different philosophies. Homeschoolers are so open to all these different philosophies, even private schools. They are open to different educational philosophies and the public education system has one philosophy, which is the Prussian model. And that is it. Like there is no other philosophy that they have and they're taking play away from younger and younger kids. It's just, it's honestly insane. I don't think that educators don't care. Districts don't care. I just think that the system is actually making it harder for them to do their jobs. It also says, in addition, there is scant evidence that voucher programs produce any improvement in student academic achievement. I think that's a weird statement. Why do you need evidence to give parental right to choose their child's education? And also, I just proved to you that the parental choice for the child's education actually helps their child succeed. So, No, (laughs) not saying that the voucher program in particular has any evidence, but the school choice evidence is there. So it says private schools that accept vouchers often deny students federal civil rights protections available to them in public schools. Some participating schools impose religious litmus tests for admission and many have policies that allow discrimination against lbgtq plus students and those with disabilities vouchers also do not generate the kind of choice vulnerable students need especially those in rural areas i'm talking about free and reduced lunch transportation behavioral and other social specialized services these are important programs students rely on for their education i have worked only at title one schools i have seen students that are like in and out of homeless shelters and i have seen students that are like in and out of foster care and things like that. So I've, I have had students where school is the place where they're going to get the very best meal. School is where they're going to probably feel the safest or the most secure. They know what to expect, right? Um, and that kind of goes into that safety and security. So yes, do I think that schools do provide a place for kids that unfortunately they have the short end of the stick? That is important for some kids Yes. However, I still think that you should have a choice. I don't think that we should completely say like, no, this is the only choice you have and too bad, so sad. Welfare for wealthy families. Public opinion remains steadfast in opposition to vouchers, even in politically conservative states. So why the resource or why the resurgence? Abrams points to a variety of factors. In a handful of states, the 2022 elections consolidated support for school privatization agenda in many states. Also, manufactured outrage over classroom curriculum and library books has further emboldened politicians intent on undermining public education. NEA. Why are you gaslighting, man? Like manufactured outrage over classroom curriculum and library books? 
Okay, no, there have been books that have been found in libraries that are very inappropriate for children. There have been things that have been being taught within schools that is not appropriate and that it should just completely stay out of schools. It's just, it's not your job. Okay, our job should be teaching academics. That's all it should be. And we are even subpar at doing that. Okay, I don't think it's manufactured. No, it's happening. So why are you gaslighting people for one? That's pretty ridiculous. Um, and for two, again, if we don't like it, we are paying you money. We are paying you taxes, which we are forced to do. It's not an option. If we don't pay our taxes, you go to jail, right? So we pay our taxes. We should have a choice. NEA, quit gaslighting. Once the term school voucher began to leave a bad taste in people's mouths, explains Catherine Bishop, president of the Oklahoma Education Association, they started calling them something else. Straightforward voucher proposals soon became education saving accounts and tuition tax credits. Under an ESA, a portion of a state's per pupil education funding is put into an account that parents can tap into to pay for approved education expenses, including private school tuition. Again, who freaking cares? it's still going towards education. <laughs> it's not like they're like, we're going to take the funding and we're going to, you know, put all this money here and we're going to go spend it on, I don't even know, something else, right? No, it's still going towards education. The parents are just getting more of a choice. Why may I ask that you care so much about a parent choosing how they want their child to be educated. Tuition tax credits in incentivized individuals and corporations to donate to nonprofit organizations, which in turn bundled the funds and dispersed them as private school vouchers. The donors receive a dollar to dollar tax credit in return. So they're literally incentivizing rich people and corporations to donate to nonprofit organizations <laughs> to help fund education. <laughs> Oh no, <laughs> what a disgrace. The narrative around who was supposed to benefit also changed, says Bishop. When vouchers first started, it was about poor kids. Now they think that kids who are already in private schools should get funding too. Again, up above, when I talked about Utah, no, they're not. At least in Utah, no, they're not. They are incentivizing. So the, the vouchers go first to low socioeconomic status, then middle class, then upper class, if there's anything left. So lies. Anywho, OEA has been lobbying against a voucher tax credit proposal that will be available to all Oklahomians regardless of income. <sighs> so everyone gets a choice and that makes you angry? Okay. Similarly, the new voucher law, law in Iowa will lift all income caps after three years as it diverts over 900 million taxpayer dollars or taxpayer funds. Sorry. States continue to push ESAs, but tuition tax credits have become increasingly popular. These policies are now on the books in 23 states. So they just go on to say that basically that these voucher schemes are just welfare programs for the wealthy and that it's going to kill rural schools, it's going to hurt the poor people, and that it's going to cause a bigger divide. I think it's honestly so weird that they are so scared that people are going to make a choice that's not the public education system. Like I said, they're still educating their kids. So why in the heck do you care where or how they are being educated unless you have an underlying agenda that you're not saying? Like there is no other reason why you would be so upset about this. And I even worked with teachers that were very upset in Utah when um, they were trying to pass this voucher law and saying basically that parents were not going to be capable of teaching their children appropriately and that um, parents were just going to homeschool for a couple years and then all of a sudden they're going to just throw their kids back into public schools because they're going to realize they hate it and then the kids are going to be behind and blah, 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 blah. Have I seen that before? Yes, I have. However, like I said, again, for the most part, if you're homeschooling, you're probably doing very well and your child is probably doing very well. And also most homeschool families, they don't necessarily put a grade level on their child. They put more of like a skill based approach on their child. So it's like, okay, what skills do my does my child need to be able to read, write, do arithmetic proficiently? Okay, like we're going to set those foundations. The rest of the time it's going to be play. It's going to be exploration. Once they get older, it's going to be internships. It's going to be, right, like they're going to go to college and all this stuff way before they're even 18 and, and so on. So for the most part, like it works. And again, private schools are outperforming public schools. I just don't 
even understand why they are so mad about these school vouchers because they're like, they're not going to get the money. It's per pupil, dude. Like, okay, you have less funding. Um, I don't know. Here's a crazy idea. Don't spend as much money at the top. How about you don't spend, I don't know, $200,000 on the superintendent's salary? And how about you spend more money on the kids? There are so many different things that we can do to solve this problem. So those are my thoughts on the school voucher system that is, or the school voucher choice bills that are going into place. And I would love to know what do you think. Do you want school vouchers? And I would love you to do as much research as you can on like, does this actually, is this going to actually take funds from public schools or is it going to be detrimental to them? And I want you to do your own research on that. But do you think that we should have school vouchers? What are your thoughts? Let me know. As always, I do hope that you have continued success in your own learning and in your child's learning. At the end of the day, you are their parent. You are the one that should be choosing how your child is educated and how they are raised. So anyways, I hope that you guys found this helpful and or entertaining and we will see you next time.